Nehemiah helped that third and final wave of Jews return to the land of promise from their captivity about a thousand years later, 445 BC. And everything in the middle of that historical section from Judges to Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, all of that unfolds the ups and the downs and you know it's mostly the downs um, regarding Israel in the land, how they went in and took possession of the land, how they eventually lost that land of promise, and then they humbly returned to the land as slaves of Persia, and they returned without a king. Now, you might be tempted to think that because there are many more books that follow Esther in the Old Testament, that there therefore must still be more events chronologically that occur for Israel, but that's not the case. Um, that's not what your English Old Testament's arrangement should incline you to conclude. The prophets, the major and the minor, from Isaiah to Malachi, they also occur within that same thousand-year period of time of history that was laid out in the historical section. They don't add essentially any new chronological events to the timeline. And then the same holds true for the wisdom books that we're in from Job, Psalm, Proverbs, um, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. They also do not add any chronological events to, the, to Israel's timeline. So again, the first point here just to back up and think about is um, once you've read through the historical books, the Old Testament chronology for the nation of Israel is basically completed. Now, let's secondly get a little closer to the psalmist and let's give some thought to um, how the rest of the Old Testament then influenced the psalmist. What was he thinking? What, what influenced him? And so we're going to start with the Pentateuch, and we're going to think about that for a moment, from Genesis to Deuteronomy. That's the law, right? The Mosaic law. Law had a profound impact on every single author of the Psalms. Remember, up to that point in human history, in Moses' day, 1445 to 1405 B.C., when the Pentateuch was written, there had been no written revelation from God. There had been no self-disclosure of himself anywhere on the planet in words. But only within one nation and within their land of promise could you find written scripture. Israel was entrusted with the oracles of God, just like Paul said in Romans 3, verse 2. So the faithful worshiper of Yahweh in Israel believed that. So as you read the psalmist, he believed we are the only nation on the planet that has the Bible. God revealed himself to us and we have it. And so the psalmist has a very high view of God's word. And it's evident everywhere in it from Psalm 1 that we should meditate on it, to Psalm 19, to Psalm 119, the psalmist has a high view of God's word. Well, what did God reveal in the Pentateuch specifically that really influenced the psalmist? Uh, what did he cast his all on? What was he banking on as he wrote in the Psalms? Particularly, it was the fusing of the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant together. Let's talk about the Abrahamic covenant for just a second, just to remind ourselves. In the Abrahamic covenant, God promised the offspring of Abraham great blessing. That word's going to come back over and over again. He promised great blessing as they believed Yahweh, and he then credited it to them as righteousness. And that blessing was inseparable from a plot of real estate called the promised land, called Canaan. God also promised that he would curse those who cursed Abraham's offspring. So faithful Israelites were absolutely committed to this truth, absolutely committed to this, these promises in the Abrahamic covenant that God's blessing was on them, it was on the land, and the nations could be blessed if they would just come to Israel. And he's firmly committed to the fact that they would be cursed if they cursed God's people. Genesis 12, 1 to 3, I'll bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. The psalmist was committed to that, to both of those. So the psalmist expresses full faith and full devotion to these things, and he incorporated them into his songs, he wrote. That's the Abrahamic covenant. What about the Mosaic covenant? The psalmist also firmly and fully believed the centrality of Israel's obedience to the law. 
to the Pentateuch. The psalmist cast his all on the truth that the land of promise could actually indeed become a place, a plot of land on earth, where the curse of sin could actually be pushed back. It was the one place on the planet you could come where you would see something almost like Eden again. He believed that. And Yahweh's blessing would abound there if only Israel would obey the law. And so the psalmist expresses in his worship of Yahweh in the Psalms the conviction that the nations could leave their sin-cursed ground of their foreign lands. They could come to Israel. They could find the blessing of Yahweh overflowing toward them through the faith of Abraham. And, they, and the, the psalmist says things like, let the nations be glad and kiss the son lest he be angry with you. He has hope for the nations who will come by faith to Yahweh while simultaneously at the same time praying for God to judge the nations who curse his people. Because both of those things had been revealed to him in the Pentateuch. Do you understand that? And it comes out, he's influenced by that. He is committed to prior revelation. Both of those elements fill the worship of the psalmist. That's the Pentateuch. Well, what about the historical books from Joshua to Esther? How did that influence the psalmist? As you leave the Pentateuch and you enter those 12 historical books, you have great anticipation for what could be for the human race on the sin-cursed planet. Could it actually be that if the offspring of Abraham would, would only believe Yahweh and then was faithful to his law, could it actually be that God would pour out his blessing on the land and on this people? And unfortunately, it doesn't take long in reading that historical section when you find out that a thousand-year period of history was far more turbulent and tragic than it was triumphant for Israel. Israel entered the land, and most of them did not believe with the faith of Abraham. And most of them did not obey with the obedience that the Mosaic Covenant called for. And the result could only be then what God promised would happen. And it could only have been what you see through those 12 books. The slow but sure loss of the land and of God's blessing and the ever-increasing creep of the curses of Deuteronomy on them. But there's a bright spot in all of that, and that's another covenant is made, this time with an individual, David, in the Davidic covenant. As the sons of David went, so went the people of Israel, for good and for bad. And this made its way into the worship of the psalmist as well, starting most of all with David himself, who wrote almost half of the psalms. And there were other faithful Israelites during that time of national decline, and they painfully knew the slow but steady slip of God's blessing from their, uh, from their nation family. They, they felt intensely the inward rebellious nature of their own sin that comes out in the Psalms. They felt the sting of betrayal of their own kings and their fellow countrymen who were being unfaithful to Yahweh. And they felt deeply the ever-increasing encroachment of the nations toward them to conquer them and to destroy them. The faithful Israelite worshiper felt all of those things acutely and expressed it clearly in his heart, sincere worship of Yahweh. They longed for a better son of David who would come and be faithful to Yahweh and lead them in faithfulness and lead them into blessing. That's how that historical section influenced the psalmist as he's writing. What about the prophets? Well, it's important to know that in Israel, the authority over the people was never the king. It was the prophet with God's word. And even the king was in subjection to the prophet and his word. The prophets always called Israel back to faithfulness to God's law in the Pentateuch. And he always started with the king's. The sons of David flourished when they humbled themselves under the prophets and the Pentateuch. And the sons of David languished when they arrogantly stood aloof from the prophets and from the law. The prophets then offered their similar sad account of that slow demise of Israel 
and her kings. So the psalmist, the faithful worshiper of Yahweh, he expresses that pain of slow loss in his worship. He feels it. Groanings and complaints. This is the prior revelation that the psalmist had, and it reveals to you what influenced a genuine worshiper of Yahweh as he wrote his worship to God. It reveals to you what moved him to write the worshipful expressions he wrote. He's not coming from your vantage point. He's coming from his. And it's your job to figure out where he's coming from and enter into his words. Do you understand that? It reveals to you the truth that governed him as he wrote more truth. And the more you can understand where his hopes were, where his fears lay, where he saw victories and where he saw his losses, the more that you will appreciate the worship of Yahweh that he expressed in his era of redemptive history. So that's the Pentateuch. That's the historical section and the prophets and how those had a bearing on the psalmist. Before we dig into Psalms specifically, what about the collection of five books that the Psalms fits within? What about the wisdom literature? That's Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. These five books also do not advance the storyline of the history of Israel chronologically. But what they do unfold is the wisdom and the worship of Yahweh that faithful Israelites indeed exercised in their covenant relationship with Yahweh before the nations of the world while their nation was sinking into the cesspool of the curses of Deuteronomy. And that's important. Again, so much went terribly wrong with Israel during that 1,000-year period of their history in the land of the Old Testament. But the contribution of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament is that in all of that spiritual turbulence of Israel's history, it's about God. God secured faithful believers, faithful worshipers, and he equipped them with wisdom to live by and worship to sing to him. He did not leave them to their own wisdom or their own self-styled worship during that horrible time of decline. These five books reveal that in the darkest of times, God knows how to secure his faithful people in his wisdom and in his worship. And that's the contribution of the wisdom literature. God knows how to hold on to his faithful people in the worst of times. And they thrive. The wisdom literature of the Old Testament, it answers questions like these. How did the faithful Israelites apply their faith and worship of Yahweh? Well, read Psalms. How did they deal with doubts and that inevitably arose in life during that time? Read, read the Psalms. How did they face afflictions and trials? Read Job. How did they give voice to their rejoicing and their thanksgivings? Read the Psalms. Did they know how to comfort and guide one another as the blessings all slipped away and the curses of Deuteronomy overtook them? Read Ecclesiastes. Did they know God's gift and comfort of marriage? Read Song of Solomon. Did they know how to skillfully navigate daily living during turbulent times, even in the household? Did they know? Yeah, read read Proverbs. The wisdom literature of the Old Testament answers those kinds of questions. This section of your Old Testament, it guided God's people through every imaginable emotion and experience of life that life could throw at them. This important section of the Old Testament, it helps complete the picture of what faithful living under Yahweh looked like in Israel as Israel occupied their privileged position before the nations. You would be impoverished if you did not have the wisdom literature in your Old Testament. Because you would be lacking this dimension of what God wants to reveal to you about how he upheld his people in wisdom and worship. 
So in this collection of books, you come across true believers who are in deep struggles to make sense of life lived for Yahweh. Individually, they did not always respond faithfully to God in the upheavals of life, and they were in great need of Yahweh. They were in great need of his compassion. They needed his mercy. They needed his wisdom. And the wisdom literature also reveals this, that music and song and poetry and a, and a turning of a wise proverbial expression, it had deep and established roots in the nation of Israel. And when David had assembled everything for the temple and uh, for his son to build, and when Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem and it became the centralized location for worship, the proliferation of music and song occurred in this nation. At the same time, the need and the prizing of wisdom, it occurred. And it occurred not just in the palace with Solomon so that the Queen of Sheba fainted under his wisdom. But do you know where the wisdom of God was primarily located? in the household with godly moms and dads who were trying to appeal to their sons to listen to them and their daughters. So you have worship, you have skillful construction of words, beautiful constructions of words and songs. You have skillful living that could be seen in this nation on that plot of real estate in the world, even though that nation was in steady decline. God knew, again, God knew how to uphold his faithful ones. He desired them to live wisely, and he desired them to live worshipfully as they attempted to fulfill their purpose before the nations. So as you read the wisdom literature, you will find these books making sense of every possible season of your life. You can become wiser, you can become a better worshiper of your Savior as you devote yourself to these books and you meditate on them, even if an immoral society is collapsing on itself around you. Let's go to number two, the background and the purpose of the Psalms. We've already been doing a little bit of the background, but since this is about the Psalms tonight, we should talk about the Psalms. Psalms is a collection of songs intended to be sung with instrumental accompaniment. That's what the Psalms are. This was Israel's hymn book to aid them in their worship of Yahweh. These songs enabled the believer in Yahweh to shepherd his heart in worship to God in any and every season of life. This collection of God-breathed songs proclaims primarily Yahweh's rule over everything that exists and how he is near to those who will believe him with the faith of Abraham. It will reveal how he is worthy to be trusted in every season of life. Psalms has 150 different psalms within it. They are, uh, there are many different authors behind the songs, but David wrote by far the most. There are 73 that are attributed to David. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm. It has 176 verses. Psalm 117 is the shortest. It has only two verses. Psalms is the most quoted Old Testament book by the New Testament authors. These 150 different psalms, they were not all written at the same time in the same place. They were written really between the time of Moses. He wrote Psalm 90. And to the Babylonian captivity, Psalm 137. That covers about 900 years of the thousand-year period of history for Israel. And Psalms is divided into five smaller books. Have you ever noticed that? Book one, two, three, four, and five. But it should be thought as really one cohesive book. Book one includes um, from Psalm 1 to 41. Book two is Psalm 42 to 72. Book three is Psalm 73 to 89. Book four is Psalm 90 to 106. You can find this as you look through your, your, your own copy of Psalms there. And book five covers Psalm 107 to 150. And it's really not clear what the rationale was for breaking them down into those five books, but your greatest benefit is going to come from just the individual psalms, and you know that already. Um, you've, that's been your experience. But what I want you to marvel at is God's kindness 
to faithful Israelites in their national turbulent and tragic downward spiral. What a kindness to those people. He knew that true believers still needed to worship him as the sinful nation ran after idols. He knew they needed to be directed in worship to him. They did not need to be left to themselves to figure that out. Psalms specifically gave to them words to put into their hearts and then voice back to God in worship. The worship of the psalmist primarily revolves again around that sovereign rule of Yahweh over all that he has made and how he directed his providence perfectly without any mistakes. The worship of the psalmist also anticipates Yahweh's rule through a promised king who is coming, Messiah, his anointed, a son of David, a son of David will rule over the people from the city of that great king from Zion. And these are the main arteries of the heart of worship for the psalmist and still for you and for me. So this is also your songbook for worship in every circumstance of life, from the greatest blessing and encouragement that you could experience to the deepest sorrows of a tried and afflicted life that you live, you'll, you'll soar to heights of thrilling praise in this book, and then you will plunge into the humble depths of confession of sin. And no matter which life location you find yourself in between those two ends of life, Psalm provides for you the instruction you need for how to worship God, the example for true worship that you desperately need. In every circumstance you can possibly find yourself in in this world, the psalmist has already been there and he's done that. And he will clarify for you what genuine worship is for the moment you are in. He will promote what genuine worship is for the moment you are in. And he will protect for you what your worship must be for the moment that you're in, whatever it may be. So if the psalmist is praying, the value for you is to worshipfully imitate him and take up his words before the Lord in prayer. If he moans under the afflictions of his own fallen flesh and the world, worshipfully moan with him. If he rejoices at the heights of a good day and welcomed providences in his life from God, worshipfully imitate his thankfulness. If he is hopeful, worshipfully imitate his hope in God. And if he's afraid and trembling under dire circumstances, trace his heart as he navigates himself out of his fear into faith in Yahweh and imitate him. If he trembles under the holy majesty of Yahweh, worshipfully pattern your fear of Christ off of his. Engage your heart in the psalmist's heart's practice, whatever it may be. So again, just marvel at God's shepherding care for sinners like you and me, that he doesn't leave you and me to our own thoughts of how to worship him in trials of life. Marvel at his fatherly guidance that he doesn't also leave you to your own conclusions about how to worship him in good times. Marvel at his kindness to have given Israel a book like this and to have given you a book like this. Now turn to Psalm 1. Let's give brief thought to how Psalms will greet you on page one. And we better get started because started, we've got 150 to go through. It's going to be amazing. I'm kidding. Every time I teach, I make a joke about time, don't I? <laughs> Kim's going to tell me that the whole way home. She's going to say, stop it. But what are you greeted by in Psalms when you start in Psalm 1? Everybody who comes here, this is what you get greeted with on page 1, and it has to do with blessing. Page 1 will focus you on where Yahweh's blessing can be found. Every reader of the Psalm starts by being directed to the individual man who is blessed. 1-1, one, one, how blessed is the man, the person, the individual Blessing is there for an individual, the individual man who keeps his life out and away from sin and who delights in the law of Yahweh, that one is blessed, verses 1 to 3. 
The individual man who refuses that is wicked and will be blown away in judgment under the curse, verses 4, 5, and 6. So Yahweh has blessing awaiting you individually. That's what greets you as you open the door of Psalms. There's blessing for me. There's blessing for me. When you move on to Psalm 2, you are forced now to enlarge your thinking and your heart to think not just about your own life and how desperately you need Yahweh's word and his blessing, but you must also think of Wow, nations, why do the nations rage and and the peoples meditate on a vain thing? Psalm 2, 2, the kings of the earth and the rulers, all of them are taking their stand against Yahweh's anointed. All of a sudden, you're, you're forced to think about nations and the son who's coming to reign over them. God says, I've installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Look at verse 10. So now, O kings, show insight and take warning, O judges of the earth. Kiss the son, lest he become angry, and you perish in the way. And you kings, his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed, now what does he say? Here's blessing again. Do you see the word blessed? How blessed are what? All. Not just the man, but in Psalm 2, now it's about all. Any nation, all the nations, rulers of the earth, all of them can be blessed. They can know this blessing that God has for his through his Abrahamic people in the land. You can know this individually. You can know this as a nation. You can come here and find this. Look at Psalm 3. How does Psalm 3 end? Look at verse 8. Salvation belongs to Yahweh. Your blessing, there it is again, your blessing be upon whom? Israel, your people, your people. And so there you are provided, uh, you're prepared for what you'll find through all of the rest of the Psalms. Individual expressions of worship and need and blessing for the individual from Yahweh. International appeals um, to come and worship and receive blessing. Let the nations be glad in the king who is coming and you will find Israel. Appeals to Yahweh to bless them God's people. And any one psalm you read could have one, two, or all three of those elements in it. Let's talk about number three, reading the psalms. If you were to read the psalms in one sitting, you would need a good chunk of time. You would need four hours and 51 minutes just to read through it. So if you want to read it in a week, divide it out over seven days, you need about 40 minutes a day to read the psalms and make your way through it. And you can do that, can't you? Right? And lastly, let's talk about number four. Let me just give you, this says five ways the Psalms are going to help the Christian, right? But I know that for time's sake, I'm only going to give you four, okay? But I will make my notes um, available online. I'll post them, and there's a lot of other goodies in there that I have skipped over pages of stuff. Um, So let's talk about four ways the Psalms help the Christian. Number one, how's this really going to impact your life? Man, there's so many countless ways. Number one, Psalms will broaden your understanding of your heart, your heart. First, what does the Bible mean when it refers to the heart? The heart is your inward self before God. Your heart is you, inwardly speaking. Your heart is not a piece of you or a portion of you, but it is you in your totality. It is who you are inwardly speaking before God. And Psalms refers to the heart about 125 times. 125 times. Psalms has a lot to say about who you are inwardly before God. When you come across the word heart, I encourage you to try to put into your own words a simple description of what the psalmist is actually saying about the heart. And then you can collect all of those. Imagine having 125 of those simple summary descriptions of what your heart is like and what God says about your heart, what it's capable of, what you need to be be wary of. Collect those simple descriptions and go through them frequently so you can have the broadest understanding of who you are inwardly before God. That would be really helpful. Let's do a couple of them together. Turn to Psalm chapter 9, verse 1. Let me show you a few of these. Psalm 9, verse 1. David says this, I will give thanks to Yahweh with all my 
heart. So what I do is I circle the word heart and off in my margin, I write a simple description and here's what I wrote. Um, the heart can be gathered up into a whole to give thanks to God. The heart can be gathered up into a whole. My inward man can be gathered up into a whole to give thanks to God. The faithful believer doesn't want to be divided inwardly with only fractions or distractions of himself being thankful and giving thanks. Everything of who he is, the, the genuine worshiper wants it all to course forward to God with thanksgiving. I need to know that. I need to gather up all of myself and not just make sure and, or just not assume that I'm just naturally, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful. No, am I really dialed in? Go to Psalm chapter 10, verse 6. Psalm 10 has several of these. We'll look at 10, 6. He says in his heart, well, who's the he? Uh, it's the wicked, greedy back in verse 3 to 4. So now we're going to get a glimpse into the wicked, greedy guy as he's thinking about his inward man. Verse 6, he says in his heart, I will not be shaken. From generation to generation, I will not be in adversity. In adversity. So I circle that one and I write over on the side, the heart can engage in internal dialogue about a false sense of security. You can do that at the heart level. Inwardly speaking, you can have a dialogue with yourself about how secure you think you are, but you ain't. He's deceived about how safe he is. Just because a man tells himself he's stable doesn't mean that he is. Look down at verse 13. Watch this. Why has the wicked spurned God? The wicked has said in his heart, you, God, you will not require it. So here's my statement on that one. The heart can engage in deceived internal dialogue about God. The wicked guy's deceived about God. He thinks God's not going to require any accountability from him. How deceived. Ah a dangerous thing that's going on in the heart. So self-deception at the heart level can exist. There can be a dialogue about my own stability before God and also what God is like, what he does and what I don't think he does. Look at verse 17. Look at Psalm 10, verse 17. Oh, Yahweh, you have heard the desire of the humble and you will strengthen their heart. The humble it's his heart strengthened. The heart can be strengthened by God to endure injustices. And that comes from the greater context of Psalm 10 as the humble one is being afflicted and going through injustices. God, God likes to come near and strengthen the inner man of the humble. That's good to know. So God is concerned about a false sense of stability in the heart. He's concerned about the self-deception that can occur in the heart, especially regarding what he is like. And he's concerned about the believer's inner frailty and weakness in affliction so much so that he will come personally to strengthen the humble believer in his heart. So Psalms will broaden your understanding of your heart and more importantly, how God meets you there as either your judge or your redeemer. There's 125 of those just waiting for you this week. Okay. Secondly, how can this book benefit you? Number two, Psalms will deepen your appreciation of God's loving kindness. Psalms will deepen your appreciation of God's loving kindness. Loving kindness is an amazing word in the Old Testament. Your translation might translate it steadfast love. It's God's covenant keeping love towards his people. He made promises and he loves them and he loves to keep his promises. He loves his people. And it was everything to the faithful Israelite. Listen, David could have been in the palace surrounded by every creature comfort, but if he felt that the loving kindness of God was distant or hard to discern, he languished even though he had everything in the palace. And on the flip side, he could be in a cave hiding from Saul and, Saul and every creature comfort is taken away, but if he had a sense that God's loving kindness is near, he was happy in a cave. 
If in a severe trial with every creature comfort taken away, as long as the faithful believer had the loving kindness of Yahweh, he could endure any and every loss. You and I get to recognize that loving kindness, that covenant-keeping love in the self-giving sacrifice of Jesus Christ at the cross for us. That's where the loving kindness or the covenant-keeping love of Yahweh is in full bloom, in full flower bloom. But as you read anywhere in the Old Testament, you get to look back on the roots of that loving kindness that is stretching itself out, preparing for Messiah to come one day and in his faithfulness die in our place, in his love for us. In Psalms, you see the roots of that covenant-keeping love laid bared for you to nourish your heart on. So I encourage you to trace that word loving kindness or steadfast love through the Psalms. It occurs about 127 times. And here's what's interesting. In the first four books of Psalms, that's Psalm 1 to 106, 106 Psalms, loving kindness occurs 67 times, okay? 67 times in 106 verses. And you might say, that's a lot. But get this, in the last book, from Psalm 107 to 150, that's just 44 psalms. It is a special theme running through out there, and it occurs 60 times. So 67 times in 106 psalms, 60 times in 44 psalms. That's a special emphasis in that last book. You will have new fuel for worship of Jesus Christ as you deepen your appreciation for God's covenant-keeping love. So psalms can broaden your understanding of your own inner man before God, and it will deepen your appreciation of God's loving kindness. And number three, psalms will inspire then your expression of love for God. Psalms will give you words to voice your love to God. And this one's really personal for me. I remember when I was struck by this as a young Christian, I was a young believer at the University of Nebraska, and that we had a godly old professor at at the university who was in the campus ministry that I was attending. And every time this man prayed, he always prayed Psalm 18.1. Turn turn and look at that. He said this, I love you, O Lord. It was somewhere in his prayer. Every single time he prayed, I love you. And he pointed us young men to that psalm, and I've tried to make that become a regular part of my prayer life um, as a whole. It's one of the ways that I actually know that God saved me and converted me nearly 40 years ago. I I still love Jesus Christ, and I need to keep persevering in my expressions of my love for my Savior. And psalms can help you do that. Let's look at these. Let's look at some of these. Turn to Psalm chapter 5, verse 11. 5, 11. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. And may you shelter them that those who love your name may exult in you. Uh, May those who love your name exult in you. You know, you can say, uh, Jesus, I love your name the name above every name. That needs to become a part of what you pray and what you voice to him and your personal devotion to him. In Psalm 18, one again, um, I love you, O Yahweh, my strength. What really captivated David at that point was how strong God was and that made him express love motivated from that strength that he saw. Well, what if you see Yahweh's hope? I love you, O Lord, my hope. I love you, O Lord, my righteousness. I love you, O Lord, my my joy. Whatever it is that impresses you in whatever season of life you're in, what you're experiencing from you, tie it up in an expression of love for him. Take a look at Psalm 31, verse 23. Psalm 31, verse 23. Oh, love Yahweh. All you, his holy ones. See, it wasn't just enough for the psalmist to do it himself, but he had to turn to others and say, you need to love him too. Express your love for him. That'd be a good thing for us to do with one another, to encourage each other to express our love for our Savior. Go to Psalm 91. This is probably my favorite. Look at this, Psalm 91. This is actually God speaking at this point in the psalm. Psalm 91, verse 14. God says, because he... 
the psalmist, has loved me, therefore I will protect him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. Listen, God loves to respond to your expression of love for him. Do you get that? Because he has loved me, Yahweh says, I will keep him. I'll protect him. So what are you missing when you don't express love for Jesus Christ to him? You have no idea how he's responding, how he might want to respond. Oh, we, we, could, we could step this up, could we not? How about Psalm 97, verse 10? Psalm 97, verse 10. Hate evil, you who love Yahweh. Well, that makes things pretty tangible. Now, love for Christ is, is clearly not just a sentimental expression, but it's actually about holiness, too. It's about hating evil. If I love him, I'll hate evil, especially in my own heart. How about Psalm 116, verse 1? Psalm 116, verse 1. I love Yahweh because he hears my voice and my supplication. So what's driving the psalmist there is I, I pray to him and he answers me. He, he, he responds to me. He's connected. He's engaged with what I'm praying. And I love that about him. You can expand that beyond that to anything. I love you because you paid my penalty. I love you because you forgive me. I love you because you've provided for my every need possible. And let's look at one more. Let's go to Psalm 145, verse 20. Psalm 145, verse 20. Yahweh keeps all who love him, but the wicked, all the wicked, he will destroy. What unspeakable, undeserved benefit is this? For you, believer, for me, as we express love for Jesus Christ, he keeps us. He doesn't crush us. And he only doesn't crush us because God crushed him in our place, right? We need to express love for our Savior. Let these words become your words to Jesus Christ. Every day, Psalms helps you express the love that you have for your Savior. Let's do one more, number four. Lastly, Psalms will clarify your confession of sin. Psalms will clarify your confession of sin. Listen, the Old Testament has a rich vocabulary for sin. Lots of different words to describe sin, to define it for us. And the psalmist is especially skillful to know how to utilize different words Hebrew words for sin in his confession of it. Do you remember in the Old Testament, the story of King Balak of Moab, and he enticed Balaam, the false prophet, and he said, hey, come up on this mountain with me over here, and you can look down on Israel encamped in the wilderness below. Take a look at them, and from that vantage point, you'll see that you should curse them. And then he took him over to a different vantage point to look down on Israel encamped in the wilderness to, to get a different vantage point so maybe he would curse him. And he kept doing that. You remember that? Well, the Old Testament's different words for sin give you different vantage points from which to look down on the sin that is encamped in your heart. And so now you can get a different perspective on what is actually going on when you sin. And the Hebrew vocabulary for sin is so rich. I'm just going to give you what I think are the top three words that are used, okay? The top three words the psalmist used that will give you a different vantage point. The first word is the word sin in English, sin. That's the English translation of a Hebrew word that the Old Testament believer used when he really felt and wanted to emphasize how his sin missed the mark of God, missed the standard of God's law, of God's very person. The psalmist used the Hebrew word translated sin when he felt the failure of his attitudes to hit God's standard, when he felt that his words uh, failed and fell short when his deeds did not meet God's holy standard, when he was convinced that he missed it entirely, he used the word sin. 
Another word that he used, the second word, is the word transgression in English. Transgression is the English translation of a different Hebrew word that the Old Testament believer used. And this time he would use that word when he really felt the rebellion of his heart. Not just that he missed the mark, but he, he, he had been really rebellious against God. He had been shaking a fist in the face of God and he didn't even know it. God had drawn a line and he had stepped across it and provoked God in his trespass, in his transgression. So that was the word that the psalmist used, the Hebrew word, transgression, when he felt the rebelliousness of his thinking, the rebelliousness of his words that he spoke to whoever around him. His attitudes were rebellious. His deeds were a shaking of a fist in the face of God. And the third word is the word, the English word, iniquity. That's the English translation of another Hebrew word that the Old Testament believer used when he wanted to emphasize that he had discovered how twisted his thinking had been, how perverted his attitude had been, how twisted and immoral his deeds had been before God. The psalmist used that Hebrew word when he felt the perversion or the twistedness of his sin. So again, these provide different perspectives, vantage points for you to look down on your sin that is camped in your heart so you can have a better understanding of what your sin actually is before God. And then you can confess it to him more thoroughly and accurately. So let's look at a passage where he does this, and let's go to the probably the most famous psalm. Let's go to Psalm 51 and look at this. Psalm 51, verse 1 and 2. You know this. This is when Nathan the prophet came to David after he had gone into Bathsheba. Now think about this. For about a period of a year, almost a year, this has been going on in David's life, and he hasn't confessed any of it. And all of a sudden now... It's hit him like a ton of bricks. What does he say? He says this, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. There's that covenant-keeping love. God, uh, your, your promise, your covenant-keeping love, I need that to be the standard by which your grace rises up and operates towards me. I want your grace firing on all of the loving-kindness cylinders it can. I, I need that with what I've just done, according to the abundance of your compassion. Now, your compassion that is abundant, I need operating at that level of compassion. I need you to do something for me. I have been rebellious towards you, and I need you to blot out my rebellion. That's what he says, blot it out. That means wipe it out, annihilate this rebellion that I committed against you. That's what he's feeling and expressing about his sin. That's the vantage point he has now as he looks back and down on what he did with Bathsheba and Uriah. Oh, what a rebel everything about me was. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Now he's realizing, oh my goodness, how twisted it is what I did. How perverted I was. And you know what? I'm filthy before God. I'm dirty. Wash me from this perversion. Wash me from this iniquity. And not only that, and cleanse me from my sin. Now he's saying, I, I missed it totally, entirely. And, and he's not just repeating, I'm dirty, I need you to wash me. But now he's thinking, as I'm a worshiper. And I'm supposed to come into your presence and worship you. And I'm ceremonially unclean. I can't even walk into your presence this way. I have missed it so badly. Um, I need you now to cleanse me and purify me so I, as a worshiper, can come back into your presence. That's what he's feeling. You see, understanding how these words bring out different elements of your own sin's nature, it enables you, believer, it enables you to be more clear with God about now what you understand about your sin and what it's like before him. 
And so you can take up these expressions of your confession of sin. They provide three different vantage points from which to look upon your sin and confess it before your Savior who, guess what, guess what, guess what? He's eager. He's eager to forgive you. He's eager to annihilate your rebellion. He is eager to wash you and make you clean. And he is eager to cleanse you as a worshiper so that you can praise him again. What a, that's two verses in this whole book. What a benefit. Think of all you gain from this book. And God gave that to Israel. They had the same thing. You can broaden your understanding of your inner self before God. So could they. You can deepen your appreciation for his love for you. So could they. You can find words to help you express your love for your Savior from this book. And so did they. And you can clarify your expression of confession to God because of this book. And they did that too. And how rich You are as a believer in Jesus Christ because of this book. God gave this to genuine believers in Yahweh who lived in a wayward, disintegrating disintegrating nation called Israel. And that nation was slipping fast down a slippery slope of sin into the curses of Deuteronomy. And yet look, look, it's not about them. It's about the God that held on to the faithful believers in Israel. And look at the kinds of things that they could express. Can you imagine coming across a believer like that in a a nation that is just unraveling? Well, guess what? You get to the New Testament, especially in Luke, in my opinion, and you get there and all of a sudden you find there's Zacharias and Elizabeth and Simeon and Anna. They were there. And God upheld them as the curses of Deuteronomy went over the tops of their heads as a nation. This is about, this book is about God. It's not about what they did and how they were really had insightful thinking about worship of God or how wise they were in the wisdom literature. This is about God and how he upholds his people. What a great God we have. Do you have anything to fear, Christian? As everything around you proceeds from bad to worse, do you have anything to fear? Listen, God wasn't interested in leaving faithful Israelites to themselves during their dark times to define what they thought worship was. He gave them biblical worship. And he has not left you to yourself to come up with what you think biblical worship is in your dark times. Listen, the sun is setting on us as a nation Come to this book. Come to the God of this book to be stabilized in your expressions of worship to Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, this is what we want to do. We are so thankful that you gave us a book like this. Uh, And the first thought that comes to my mind is how I, I fail to be in this book enough. And yet, there's even grace for us for that as as well. Would you please um, fuel our hearts with the truths of the book of Psalms in the Old Testament and, and, and create in us a hunger to come racing back to this book in the middle of our Bibles so that we can have better expressions of worship of you, and so that you can draw out of us the worship that you are worthy of. We don't have to come up with our own words. There's there's a whole set of words here and expressions that we can adopt. Help us to do that. Do it so that you get the glory that you are worthy of. Do it so that we are a bright light in a nation that the sun is setting on and what hope it'll bring for those that you are drawing to yourself when they see our light. So Father, accomplish in us what only you can. You are a great God. Thank you for the book of Psalms. It's in your son's name we pray, amen.